Welcome to the Rebooting Business Podcast, where we discuss how businesses can reboot, rebuild, and come back bigger and stronger than ever before in a post-COVID-19 reality. And now, here's your host, David Summerfleck. And hello, thank you for joining us for another episode of Rebooting Business. I'm your host, David Summerfleck. This is episode number 33 of Rebooting Business, brought to you by the Digital Marketing Specialists online at dms.blue. My guest today is AJ Davis. Hi, AJ, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. AJ is an industry expert in user experience strategy with a proven track record for delivering true value to businesses. She has led optimization strategy for Fortune 500 companies during her tenure at Clearhead, including CVS, Steve Madden, and Lululemon. Uh, she has also created the user research practice and team at Clearhead. AJ is a Willesley College alumni and has a master's in human factors and information design from Bentley University, which I think is fascinating. So AJ, let's start with an introduction and some background. Can you please start with your uh, areas of expertise? What really motivated you or or how you got interested in your area of expertise? Um, And let's just get started with that if that's okay with you. Yeah. Yeah, you know how as marketers and business owners, we spend all this time and energy getting people to just know who we are, and then they come to our websites and they leave. Yeah. Um, This is the thing I'm passionate about solving is kind of connecting the dots between what is it about the way that we talk about our business, present our offering to the world, and what is the user experience we're putting out there that helps or hurts our conversion rates? Yeah, so let's be clear for those who don't know, when you talk about technical terms like user experience and conversion rate, um, to me, user experience is very simply how users of a company website can navigate that company website, but also how they can use it if they can use it. And And tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, I guess to me, a good comparison would be comparing a website like irs.gov to that of Walmart. One is really easy to navigate and one is stressful to navigate, or at least was the last time I looked at it. Um, And that's, to me, that's user experience. Is that accurate? Yeah, user experience can encompass a lot of things, but it's definitely navigation. It's figuring out what is the site about, so it's your perceptions of things, your ability to quickly understand, and then the little interactions as well. So what does it look like to figure out how to go from the home page to the page that you're trying to achieve the thing on? So for the IRS, how do you find the right form? For yeah. Walmart, how do you find the product you're looking for? And then how do you even understand when it's going to arrive, how it works, how to fill out the form. I see all of that as part of the umbrella of the user experience. All of that is how the user is interacting with or perceiving what your business does. And conversion ratio is going to be how many interactions does the business owner accumulate or get basically from people looking at your company website, whether that's an email or a direct purchase or a phone call. Is that, do you think that's fair? Yeah, it's basically how many people could be taking the action and then how many people actually take it. And so the goal changes business to business, whether it's making the sale or getting the email address or getting the lead. So how do you break that down so that it's not this intimidating monster to the business owner? And then conversely, people who are in the digital marketing web design arena, how do you get them to take it more seriously? So I guess that's a two part question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple things. I mean, all businesses are out there trying to do something, trying to grow, trying to build a business. Yeah. So we really, for business owners who may be less uh, familiar with the nuances of what we do, we really just talk about revenue. Like what are the things that lead to more revenue for your business? more customers, those customers doing more with you, um, those coming back more often. 
and doing more business with you. So we just talk about those different levers and then the data that corresponds with it. And then for marketers or folks who may be more data driven and how they think about their strategies, um, we break it down further. So there's the overarching conversion rate of your site. There's the ultimate goal we're trying to get people to do, but there's a lot of things along the way. So we even think within a site, what is the funnel? So homepage, product page, and when, check out. Mm -hmm. and when you talk about funnel, we're talking about the design, right? Mm -hmm. So you yeah, see, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, it's exactly like there's so many ways to think about funnels. And so sometimes I even just break it down as like the customer journey of the website, it's like yeah. these different steps along the way and people can get lost or confused. And so we want to make sure we smooth those out. So, I mean, it's really common for the, the typical business owner to get lost in in jargon, trying to understand the technical terms when you really want to help them get from point A to point B. So I guess the, the biggest obstacle for those in digital marketing and also conversely for the business owners, how to demystify all of this and make it relevant to them. So you break it down by first talking about revenue. How do you do that? Do you say, is your company website getting the conversions that you need to see returns on investment? Or do you phrase it some other way? How do you get started with that? I mean, I'd love to just start with the question of like, what is your business, what are your business goals and what are some of the things you're struggling with? Because at the end of the day, some businesses are struggling with getting people to know what, that they exist and getting visitors to their site. And that's a different strategy than we've got all these people coming to our website, but they're not buying. So like, what do, how do we close the gap on that? And so, so for some people, they're going to know that's a conversion problem. That's the term I need. That's the type of service I need. But at the end of the day, like we'll help pinpoint in that initial conversation. Is it, you know, the website itself or is it something before the website that you need another partner to help you with? I mean, it seems to me that conversions are really an integral part of marketing period of growing a business. Um, how directly relevant do you think conversions are tied into SEO, which is search engine optimization? Yeah, I mean, those two are to me the same, like two sides of a coin, right? So the search engine optimization really helps us get people to the site. And if you've got good SEO, you're getting more eyeballs and more visits and you're reaching your audience. And then on the flip side, once they're there, once you've gotten them with your search engine optimization efforts, you've got to make sure you guide them through so they can go from being a visitor to a customer. So would you prioritize SEO at the, the top of the importance list or no? It depends on where the business is. So if you've got one or two visitors a day, you've got to focus on things that are going to get people to the site. Right. And SEO is a huge part of that journey, uh, whether it's SEO or maybe some social media efforts or advertising. Um, but at the end of the day, once you do have a good amount of traffic, you've got to learn from that data and understand what's there. I wanted to get your input too, because I always thought that by when I first started getting involved. I mean, I, when I worked for marketing agencies, it was different because you had the oversight of customer service and the sales team. And working in between those agencies as an independent contractor or freelancer, it always amazed me how few business owners that I spoke to were cognizant of SEO and e-commerce and content marketing and repurposing content and everything. Why is that disconnect there or, or is it still prevalent today or do you, is it positioning? You know, I think that the, the problem for both conversion rate optimization and SEO is that there's a perception out there that you just go and you get a website. Yeah. And then it's static and it's like, now they can come. My doors are open. They're going to find out about us. Yeah, it's one but and done. It's one and done. So it's like, if you think of a physical store, I've opened my store location. Have, they're not really asking like, what is this store location in the virtual world? Because it's not street traffic that just walks by unless you have a good SEO strategy and people aren't going to understand the products that you're selling or where the cash register is unless you've opened your doors and like in, interacted with people within the store. So I tend to move towards that analogy of like the real world where if you've got a website you've just put up, you've, you've built a store really far away from many streets. Like you don't have anyone going by and we've got to get the doors open and put you in the good location. 
Yeah, I think that's a, a good uh, metaphor. So at, at what point in the onboarding process do you start talking about metrics? How do you define uh, key performance indicators or KPIs and specific metrics? Where do you, where do you begin defining those and how do you define those? Yeah, so most businesses in our initial conversations, we're talking about the three tops. We're saying, what does revenue look like? How many vid visitors are you getting? Um, what does your conversion rate look like? So just those like the, the, big, the big ones that add up to revenue. And then as we start working with customers, we will first do an analytics audit and we'll take a look at a bunch of metrics that we know are important, but we'll only surface the ones that we see are really on fire or the big opportunity or signaling there's a problem. And that's where we'll spend some time explaining why we care about those metrics, why we need to do something about them. Then we'll develop a set of test ideas that we'll A-B test with them. And then again, it's this other opportunity where we want to make a change somewhere on your website and what metrics are going to be impacted. Now, can, so, yeah. I was just going to ask you, can you break that down a little bit um, into increments when you're talking about A-B testing? Now, I know what A-B testing is, or at least I think I do but you also have AA testing. So can you kind of break that down and demystify it a little bit? Of course, yeah. So let's say, um, let's stick with that analogy of a physical store. So what, what's really neat about uh, the internet is that you can basically create two equal looking stores next to each other with the same foot traffic nearby and people aren't aware of the two stores and you change one variable. And so what it allows you to do is say, you know, if I put this banner at the front of my store, do people respond to that better? And are they more enticed to purchase versus this other design that we have in mind for communicating this? And so A-B testing is a mechanism that we can use very easily in the online space to make one small change and then be able to quantify the difference in what customers ultimately do because of that change. Okay. So it allows us to make like data-driven decisions and say, we know for sure that this thing caused the impact and so we should do it. So if a, a, whether you're a business owner or a digital marketing guy or a freelancer and you're working with a client, if you want to get started showing some of these metrics, or I should say even begin with metrics, is Google Analytics the best place to start? Or is there another um, arena or tool that you think should come first or an act, I should say? Yeah, it's a great question. Google Analytics has a lot of power. And so what's really great about it is you can really dive into specific segments, you can set up new things. And what I mean by segments is like new versus returning customers, like what's the experience look like for them. But for a lot of people, if they have never used Google An Analytics before, or um, they just want to focus in on asking a couple of questions that are the burning questions or the first ones to start with, Sometimes Google Analytics can just be really overwhelming. Yeah. So if you don't have a partner to help you with it, you should have it running so you can capture the data. But you might try a tool like Hotjar where you can get some click tracking and you can get a sense of like, are people scrolling on this page? What are they clicking on this page? And it's great because it gives you a visual of what the interactions look like. Whereas Google Analytics, you have to infer from the numbers what it means. Yeah, I kind of talk, I kind of see Google Analytics as like, dental work. I don't enjoy it, but I know it needs to be done. Um, and, and that's largely, I, I don't have the, the, the credentials that you do. Um, now, if you want to talk about conversion ratios, are there some quick, easy wins or as opposed to more long-term, long-haul conversion tactics? Are there some quick, easy wins that uh, business owners can get started with, like maybe Google Analytics. But if they don't know what to look for, they're going to be lost in the weeds. Yeah, I hear this all the time from business owners. Like I ask them what tools they have and they, they list off the tools they have tagged on the site and that may or may not be collecting data, but yeah. they feel like they're, they're like drowning in this monsoon of data and they don't feel like there's a clear direction of what to take action on. So for business owners that want to just take some action today, I'd have three things that they should look for, and it doesn't require any tools. 
So for a lot of businesses, we look at their website and their landing pages. So that first impression that customers get are missing one of these three and maybe all three of these elements. So the first one is that your website needs to really clearly state without any work, what problem you're solving or what you're bringing into someone's life. Because yeah, your product exists. it needs to state that very clearly. And I mm -hmm. guess that would count as what we call the CTA or the call to action. I actually consider it sort of separate. So I think of three different things that connect all to this concept of focusing attention and communicating quickly. So um, the call to action, I think of as the third one of this, but it's all connected. So okay. that section above the fold is so powerful. And what I mean by above the fold is visitors can see it without doing anything, without scrolling, without clicking. The first thing they see should include what this business is solving, what this business is in really, really plain English, and then a call to action. So click this button to fill out our form or click this button to see our product collection or fill out this form and we'll get in touch. So people understand what you do, what you're solving, and then how to get your help for it. Okay, that's something that's actionable. And when you talk about, I, I, I've heard people get very confused when I used to go to a lot of networking events. People would get very confused by landing page versus website. I need a landing page. And here's what I wanted to point to. Now, obviously, there's much more that goes into it than that. Can you differentiate the landing page versus the actual website? but not just the differences, but how the two kind of interact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the times we wanna be very targeted in our communication and we wanna give people just the core information they need so then they can take action and convert. And so a landing page can structure all of that on one page with the simplest, most straightforward information and then at the bottom, they can do the thing. So an example of that would be? Uh, let's go back to your IRS example so if the irs were to do a redesign and really think about their different approaches they may have a landing page that is all the forms that you need to get your small business started so then rather than you having to kind of search through the navigation and figure out yourself which forms you need it could say welcome small business owners we're so excited that you're ready to get started on your taxes here are the three forms that you need and then click that to download all of them so let me ask your opinion so i've been thinking of creating a course for lawyers on digital marketing. So what, by that definition, would a landing page be appropriate if I said, okay, I'm gonna create a landing page and say, dear lawyers, just as an example, uh, boy, you guys are great. On that landing page, there's gonna be a video introduction to what this course is about. And then below that, here are the benefits, and then below that, go ahead and sign up here. Is that a fair entry? Okay. Yeah, that's pretty reasonable. So, and in the context of your business, uh, the reason you would be building a landing page is because you're communicating to lawyers. But very specific. To much a broader audience. Right. So the website is talking about marketing, and then your landing page is, hey, lawyers, here's how I work with you. Right. And that's always kind of how I perceived landing pages as being a more specialized um, offer for a specific group of people. So if you're a guest on a podcast, for example, and you want to have um, an offer for people listening to that podcast, I've seen that, but it doesn't really differentiate market very much. You know what I mean? It's more like, here's just an offer for anybody listening. Couldn't they just go to your company website and get the same offer? Um, but let me ask you about the role of product research. And I know that's a little bit different, but it might be connected. I wanted to get your take on the role of product research. Where does that fit in to conversion ratios? And how do you kind of get a grip on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for, so for me, we were talking about user experience earlier, and we can be really specific and say to just your website, but your customers actually have a lot of touch points with you. And so if you think about product research more generally, it allows us to understand who are customers, what motivates them, why are they our customers? And that might help us better communicate to future potential customers. Um, and then we can even get as granular as do people um, understand how to move through our navigation? 
What is the experience of opening the package for our product? There's so many questions we can ask. And so to me, product research is this overarching toolbox of ways of answering those questions. So, yeah, and, and what I like is when you mention touch points, because I've read about that, but I haven't heard too many people talking about it. And touch points are basically user experience, design, the calls to action, the subscribe options. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, to me, a touch point is any interaction where there's something happening with the customer, which is a really vague way of saying you could, could be that I click to subscribe. What's that touch point look like? I want to subscribe. What is there an email that comes afterward that confirms it? Is there something that pops up that says, we're so excited to have you in our tribe? Like there's a bunch of things about that one goal that you can create or that one touch point that you can create a really good experience around. I also wanted to get your take on email automation. And if I'm straying too far from the farm, let me know. But when it comes to conversions, to what extent do you think email plays a role in converting the casual browser to the actual client? I mean, in, there's so many different factors just in that alone. There's open rate, but then there's also how quickly do you respond to people emailing you? And then what do you offer? And to what extent do you automate? How deep do you go into that? Yeah, I, fortunately, this is not my area of expertise. So I'm not going to pretend that it is, but I can tell you from what we see, email is an essential piece of the business. And there's so much variety in terms of the impact. So the way we look at email is we're asking, how does the, how do people who come from email convert and how do they behave differently than somebody who might have just Googled you and found you? And so for us, we consider them, um, there's different behaviors that might be associated with someone who's already gone through the, the work of signing up for your email list. But in terms of the effectiveness of individual campaigns and headlines and what do you put in the email, there's a whole field of testing in that area and optimization, which isn't our area, but there's definitely people who really uh, can get, you can get really granular and find what works best there. Do you think, I wanted to, it, when, when we talk to business owners, in a lot of cases, especially with nonprofit organizations, if I asked them what goals they have, their goals are always, I need more donors, period or it's a, the, the new business owner, I need more money. So it's almost like, okay, I am at a loss. You're, you're just so vague. Um, what, what goals do you think the, the, the struggling small business owners should have that are more specific and more granular, like you said, and more helpful? Yeah, I mean, in a way you can add, you can have that top level goal because it gives you a singular focus of we need to grow revenue by x amount this year right um, but then you have to ask why or how you're going to achieve that and break yeah. it down into a couple of hypotheses for how you might achieve that goal so you know for us if we were talking about strictly an e-commerce business you could have a couple of different levers you could pull to grow your revenue you could have the same amount of traffic increase conversion rate and now you've made more money you could have the same number of purchases, increase average order value or how much people are buying per order, and that could increase revenue. And so it tends to be that it's a combination of all these factors together. We'll increase how much people spend by this much. We'll have this many more people come to the website and we'll have this many more people order. And so it's about thinking about all the different levers you have and then having efforts to really move the needle on those things. So with your, company at Clearhead and a, a business owner contacts you, do you look at these different levers in a particular way to try to find out what is working versus what is not working? Yeah. Um, so just to be clear, Clearhead was a company I used to work at and okay. now I run a company called Experiment Zone. Um, but oh, okay. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Okay. The way that we work with our clients at Experiment Zone is that we um, do look at all those levers, but for some business owners, they uh, they may have a sense of where they are today, and the goal is really just about conversion to begin with. And then once we get working with them, we talk about these other levers. 
we saw that this change didn't change conversion, but we got them to buy more. Is that desirable? Do we want that? For some people, it's about um, you know, getting the right size to the customer so they decrease their return rates. So there's a number of different things that once you get in there, you can kind of talk about them. But at the end of the day, it's all these things add up to more or less revenue. Yeah. Have you found that what, well, I, I guess I want to ask you more open-endedly, what trends have you noticed since COVID began in terms of how you work and who you work with? Yes. Uh, COVID has been really fascinating in, in, our, in our space. Um, obviously, it's a bigger tragedy for the world, and I, I don't want to leave that aside. But the silver lining in this is that we have a tremendous shift in customer behavior, which as a human factor scientist, I find fascinating to look at. And so kind of looking at that piece of it, we are seeing huge shifts in like, which part, what, what are people buying? What are people running out of? So just like you can, there's lots of things you can look up in terms of, you know, across COVID hitting, we're seeing suddenly people needed refrigerators or suddenly yeah. they wanted flour or suddenly they had these different consumer products that everyone jumped on board. So it's a bit of this like um, kind of race to specific products that we're seeing. But with our client set, we're finding that um, consumers are looking for things that uh, people are shifting to online. So we're seeing a lot more traffic to e-commerce e stores. And um, it is a little bit more competitive right now because everybody's completely focused on their e-com store. So it's really important to stay on top and keep all those metrics in mind so that you're not losing out because someone else has a better experience or you're tripping your customers up because they're not sure when the product's going to arrive and things like that. Do you think, sh from my perspective, I think every business should have e-commerce because we all need money. I, I've never met a business yet that doesn't want to take money for some way, but the overwhelming majority of business websites don't have e-commerce. And I don't understand the disconnect from that. With what you do, do you think every business should have e-commerce? Wouldn't it help their conversions to have, you know, pay your bill here? You know what I mean? It, it would just seem like a no-brainer to me. And how, what, what are your feelings on that? Yeah, you know, I think um, what's brilliant about digital is that we have a really clear sense of what's working and what's not. So if you shift everyone to calling you on the phone or doing a more manual process, you like you easily lose out on that data. And so it's really hard to make decisions about your business without good data. So that's the first thing that pops in my head for that. Uh, but then the other side is a customer experience. And so for potentially some businesses online, isn't quite right for their audience, but I, it's hard for me to come up with that on the spot, like, because there's so few of those. Most businesses should have some element of everyone's online, everyone look, looks for ease of use, and digital is a really important channel to achieve that for your customers. So I would say the answer is yes, with like a little asterisk that there's probably some audiences where that's not going to be helpful for them and would not have a good return on investment. But in general, making it easy, putting it in the space where people are spending most of their time is going to have a lot of benefit to the business. Have you noticed more businesses showing an interest in con conversion optimization and conversion ratios since COVID began and just more contact um, initiated with you and, and your business? Or has it been the same since COVID began? Oh, it's completely changed. I think people at the beginning were kind of unsure if COVID was going to stick around. And so there was a little bit of, you know, uh, maybe shuffling some of their efforts, but not changing their overall strategy in terms of the mix of e-com. Yeah. But, you know, over the summer, we got a surge of interest because, you know, if your e-com channel is not keeping up right now, your business is not keeping up right now because e-com is the business for most companies. It is. And I think a lot of small business owners are really struggling trying to, to, get a grip on what's going on. And they seem to still be stuck in this mindset of the way it was 10 or even 20 years ago. Um, but yeah, it just, it, it seems to me that there's still, there's a greater need now more than there ever was before in history. 
And like you said, there's so much more competition. So if I go to a company website and I can't purchase what I want online, I'm just going to go back to Amazon or I'll go to eBay. Mm -hmm. And it, it does, it does seem like a big factor. Um, well, let me ask you if you could recommend for those listening or watching who want to learn more about conversion ratios and, and the relevance to them, are there any sources that you would recommend? Yeah, um, I uh, well, I'll plug our own blog. We've got a great post. Feel free. Walks through all the details of everything. So if you go to um, experimentzone.com and go to our blog section, you'll find the, oh, the ultimate guide to everything conversion rate optimization. Um, I think in terms of some like breaking it down even further, I think there are a couple of tools and a couple of ways to think about getting started, which isn't like you've got to know everything about conversion rate optimization, but starting with, can I get more people off my homepage to some other step, right? That first impression, in addition to those three questions I mentioned earlier, using a tool like fivesecondtest.com is one of my favorite things to gift people with because uh, it's a really low cost way to get real customer reactions to things or real participant, like real people that aren't your your people, your friends and family sitting around you giving you feedback. And it gives you a chance to like get a sense of, do people even know what my website's about? Do they know what action to take here? And so for me, that's like the, the, that's the very top of your website funnel is that first impression. And so spending time really optimizing that is a good starting place for most businesses. Okay. Well, I appreciate your input and your time. Are there any other subject matter that you would like to touch on? You know, I think that it's, you know, you brought up COVID and I think it's one of those opportunities to stay really on top of your customer needs. This is something I'm finding um, people have been a little bit reluctant around. It's like they spent a lot of time getting online and getting the business on and trying to optimize the data. Yeah. But I think our real world has changed. And so customers' needs have changed and that can have an impact on what products you put out there. And so just like some companies pivoted and added masks at the beginning of COVID, um, there's gonna be new needs that are arise constantly. So my big, like my number one tip to every business in this crazy time that's changing so fast is to talk to your customers 10 times more often than you were before or a hundred times more often if you weren't doing it at all. Um, you know, like really get out there and talk to them and understand what's going on with them in their day to day, because you'll un you'll uncover some new problems as we keep going through this that you'll your business may be able to help solve. OK, well, um, thank you so much for taking the, the time to talk with us today. Um, would you like to uh, plug anything before we go? There's experimentzone.com mm -hmm. and uh, can listeners or viewers follow you on any social media outlets yeah we're on all the main channels so experiment zone for all of the main social platforms we do have a giveaway that i'd like to share with your audience there you go okay report card so this is an opportunity for us to have our experts on our team give you three to five pointers about your website so i gave you some high level tips today but get them get personalized get more specific to your needs so it's available at experimentzone.com and we'll give you within a week those three to five suggestions. They're completely free and completely personalized to your site. Okay. Well, thanks again for your time and I enjoyed talking with you. Please stick around for another minute or two, okay? Yeah, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. You've been listening to Rebooting Business, the podcast for about and by America's small business owners who are ready to reboot and rebuild businesses in a post-COVID-19 world. To learn more about rebooting your business or be a guest on the podcast, please visit www.dms.blue today.